say to them, do you bring in a lamb to put it, put it under a bar or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Mm, whatever, is hid <coughs> whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measured measure you see, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more, whoever does not have. Even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or get up, gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how or by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the fur kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to, sickle to it, because the harvest, <coughs> harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to, that, you use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar par parables, Jesus <coughs> spoke the word to them, as much as not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own dis disciples, he explained everything. Amen. Love God. Love your neighbors. The title of my message is The Parables of the Kingdom. So let's read the key verse together, verse 27. Okay, let's go. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the sea sprouts and grows. In today's passage, Jesus teaches the secret of the kingdom of God through two parables. The parable of the growing seed and the parable of the mustard seed. It is about the mysterious form of the kingdom, where the kingdom of God is in the hearts of men and women who believe in Jesus, but the king will be absent. It is an invisible kingdom. These parables teach us what the invisible kingdom is like until Jesus comes again. Jesus anticipated the misconceptions people would have about this type of invisible kingdom. What is the kingdom of God like today? Is it glorious, full of wonders, pomp, and power? Right? No, Jesus says, no, it is more like a mustard seed. The mustard seed is not impressive. It is very small and insignificant compared to the glorious kingdom. Even though it starts small, it grows into a big tree. The seed has a growing power. It will grow regardless of whether we sleep or the get up. So in order to understand the parables of the kingdom, we need to pay close attention to God's word. So may the Holy Spirit open the eyes of our hearts to see Jesus and his kingdom through these parables. Uh, first, obtain the light and let it shine. Look at verses 21 and 22a. Esther, can you read? 
He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. One who puts his lamp under a bowl or bed is very stupid. <laughs> He's a man without common sense. For example, if we waste energy if we turn a flashlight on and hide it in the drawer. What will happen if we hide a burning lamp under a bed? There is a danger that he will burn his hands and fingers and legs when the bed is burned by the lamplight. Therefore, we draw an obvious conclusion. We must put the lamp on his stand to brighten the whole room. Here the lamp, the lamp, represents Jesus himself. Though being in the nature of God, Jesus hid his true identity while on earth. Jesus did this to avoid misunderstanding. Fallen men had their own expectations about the Messiah. Their expectations were contrary to God's will and often hindered Jesus' work. Jesus wanted man to truly understand his identity as the suffering servant, that he came to die for the sin of the people. But it was not easy to educate people about this. It challenged deeply held beliefs. And Jesus did not try to educate everyone. Jesus revealed himself clearly to his own disciples. So when Jesus, when the Apostle Peter confessed, you are the Messiah. Jesus revealed his death and resurrection, his transfigured image in his glory, and his ascension into heaven, and his coming again as king and judge. So Jesus revealed himself little by little to a small number of people until, he, until they truly understood him. And through them, Jesus revealed his true identity and mission to the whole world. Jesus, who was hidden, that he was hidden, is now revealed clearly. So when you receive this truth now, we should not hide it, but let it shine. We should let the light of Jesus guide our lives. We should let the light of Jesus to transform us. We should preach this truth to the whole world. Anyone who tries to hide the light of Jesus is a foolish man. James chapter 1, he says, do not merely listen to the word so and so deceive yourselves. Do what he says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what he says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what it looks like. So we must take time to evaluate how we live according to God's word. We must constantly correct ourselves according to the word of God. When our action matches what we teach, our testimony will have a power and authority. However, due to our hypocrisy, we do not live up to our own teachings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we fail to teach properly. And also we feel that we are, we are not competent enough to teach. Then we don't even try. We don't even try to teach the Bible. We don't let the light shine. But Jesus gives the assurance that the word of God itself has a power. God will work despite of our weaknesses. We do not need to worry about what will happen after we share God's word. So 18 years ago, we had a woman missionary named Esther Lee. She felt that she was not qualified to invite students and teach the Bible due to a broken English. But she prayed, and God gave her strength to go out and invite students to Bible study. And she met power 
who then brought Sheila and Wafa, her sister, twin sister. So God's word planted in their hearts through Michelle and Esther Lee for fruit, despite her broken English. This is precisely what the next parable is about. The second, the parable of the growing seed. Look at verses 26, 26 through 29. And I'll quickly, could you read that? He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the top, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Here the man refers to a Bible teacher or the messenger. Without scattering the seed, nothing happens. So Paul, that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 10, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So we see the viral role of a man who scatters the seed on the ground, who preaches the word. We must appreciate someone who scatters the word of God to our hearts. Look at verse 27. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Here we see the role of God. Once the Bible teacher or shepherds scatter the seed, the Bible teachers do not know how the seed grows. All they have to do is to scatter the seed and water, watch how the seed grows. They don't need to stay up all night to find out how the seed grows. They need the faith that the seed will grow. Why? Because the seed has a life in itself. So the, this parable teach, tells us that the kingdom of God grows in our hearts day after day, month by month, year by year. Once the man scatters the seed, it is not his responsibility to grow the seed. It is God who makes the seed grow. God provides a proper temperature for the seed to germinate, germinate here, and then right amount of rain and sunshine for the seed to grow. It is a great mystery how the seed grows and becomes uh, fruitful. God grows the seed mysteriously. If a man tried to dig the ground to see what's going on, to the seed, he will ruin the seed before it even it sprouts. So Bible teachers must be patient and wait for the seed to grow. So the main role of the Bible teachers is to water the plant and make an environment for the seed to grow. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, I planted the seed Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he waters is anything. Only God who makes things grow. So it takes time for harvest. It took three years for Jesus to raise up his disciples. We see that our Bible students become much Bible teacher after only one year of a Bible study. So we shout out Bible students, grow, grow fast. <laughs> and if they don't grow fast, we become very nervous and impatient. And the students become, get exasperated and they quit the Bible study. So we ruin young plants because of our impatience. Most farmers, they have to wait six or seven months to harvest. Look at verse 29. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Here the harvest refers to the saving of souls. So John Newton was a slave trader and he lived a wild life. He lived a terrible life. He kills and raped the slaves and he drunk, indulged in drunkenness. But one day, 
during a storm, severe storm, he remembered his mother's prayer. And in his desperation, he prayed for deliverance. The seed sown by his mother bore fruit, and he was saved. So he, that's why he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. And you know that song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And so on. We'll sing after my message. <laughs> With amazing grace. He said that there will be three great surprises in the last day. The first, there will be people there with Christ that we never expected to be there. Second, there would be people not there that we felt would be there. But the greatest surprise of all would be that the old slave trader named John Newton would be there by the grace of God. We never know who will be harvested in the end. Only God knows because he is the one who grows our faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we should not give up <coughs> our Bible students because of their many bad habits. We get so frustrated saying they are the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> he will never change. That's a compliment. <laughs> and uh, same with our children. Uh, many uh, we despair because we do not see our children grow up in faith. But frankly speaking, we don't know what's, uh, what's going on in their hearts. So we need the patience in their spiritual growth and pray and wait for them to become the full kernel in the head. <coughs> so this parable encourages us to trust God in our shepherd life. When you teach the Bible, we need the patience. So Hudson Taylor, the great pioneer missionary to China, said that there are three qualifications for missionaries. Patience, patience, and patience. That's the qualification of, for anyone in the work of God. Someone has said that the secret of patience is doing something else in the meantime. So this man was sleeping, getting up, and not going to bed, and doing his day's work. The thing we can be doing while we are waiting and patiently looking for the harvest. So the thing we have to be doing while we are waiting for the harvest is doing the daily activities. Keep sowing, keep watering. That's our job. Some go a lifetime without seeing much fruit. But God's word promises that the harvest will come. So what a challenge. We need to be sowing. We need to be watering. We need to be waiting. But this is not only a challenge, but also hope. So we need to wait and be patient and not despair. Life is in the seed. Rather than being anxious, so we sometimes we wonder, oh, I, should have, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have rebuked that first guy. <laughs> and I had a chance. <laughs> I should have done, I should have shared that one Bible verse. <laughs> I only have the Bible I remember. But we should trust that the Word of God has a power and wait on God and sleep well. Sleep well. <laughs> and third, lastly, the parable of the mustard seed. In verses 30 through 32, Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed. Look at verses 30 through 32. Uh, Kevin, can you read? Again, he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So mustard seed 
is not the smallest seed you can get. So Jesus looks like wrong. But what Jesus was talking about was in, in Israel concerning the usage of seeds in his day. So it was the smallest seed that generally could be bought and sown. So you have heard this parable many times that is explained in terms of something very small growing rapidly into something big, a metaphor for how the Christianity started, started with a baby Jesus in a manger and grew to a most dominant religion in the world. So tiny mustard seed does quickly grow into a big bush <laughs> that can reach as high as 10 or 12 uh, feet. So that's not wrong. That's the one interpretation. But this parable is speaking more than just the church starting small and growing rapidly. So let me explain. Uh, so in, so in the Jewish culture, rabbi, rabbis, according to the rabbi, it was, they, it was not allowed to plant a mustard seed in one's garden because, because of the law that prohibits planting different kinds of seeds together. So what would happen if you put a mustard seed in your garden? It would very rapidly spill out of its row into other rows and mixing and mingling with the other plants, dropping seeds everywhere, which would sprout up more mustard plants. And before long, it would take over the whole garden. And mustard plants produce lots of seeds, and seeds attract birds. Who wants a bird? in their vegetable garden. Most gardeners do everything they can to keep birds out. So in the parable Jesus told, birds perched. In other words, they found rest in the branches of the mustard bush. So they felt a sense of security within the bush, being less exposed to predators and weather. So the parable of the mustard seed it's about the power of the kingdom of God. Once you plant it, it will grow, take over your whole garden. It will mess up your neatly maintained garden. And many people will come and find the security. As we studied uh, in Mark's gospel, that's exactly what Jesus did. You know, to value people over rules and traditions. Jesus disregarded the tradition of the Sabbath. He disregarded the law and touched the leper. He disregarded the social norm concerning fellowship with the despised tax collectors. In Jesus, many despised people came and found the security and rest. So that's why Jesus, so what Jesus is saying is this. This is what God's rule and reign look like. If you allow the kingdom of God into your heart, it's going to mess up your neatly maintained garden. It's going to break down your neatly planned life. It's going to attract and shelter the ones everyone else try to keep out. It's not going to look majestic, neat, and impressive, but rather common and unremarkable, initially very small but it will spread like crazy. So, will you insist on maintaining your neatly maintained doctrinal gardens? Or will you allow God's rule and reign to mess things up, mess up your life? <laughs> <laughs> each of us individuals, each church community is the man with a mustard seed in his hand. So we just have to let go and drop it in our garden and watch what happens. If you allow it, it will grow to take over your, our garden. 
and we will be a blessing to so many people. And finally, look at verse 24. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. After hearing the word, we must spend some time to think about it and pray over it until you grasp the real truth in it. We must apply the truth of Jesus to our lives. This means that our thought patterns, behavior, even our desires must change according to the word of God. Otherwise, not only we do not understand the truth, but we will be even more confused. Mm. Jesus teaches us to work hard to consider his word and practice it. Because God blesses who do so. So that's why Jesus said, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. God blesses us with more understanding as much as at the effort we have made. So God knows who seek him superficially. No one can fool God. Those who struggle little will be blessed little. But those who struggle wholeheartedly will receive full blessing. Will be true disciples of Jesus. May the Lord help us to consider carefully what we have heard and open our eyes to his glorious kingdom. So let's sing Amazing Grace in 85.